I'm going to be talking about uh, a topic that I call the two things you must know to successfully pick stocks. I know here at The Money Show you get a lot of perspectives and a lot of ideas about ways to invest in the, in the stock market and the bond market and the futures markets and the commodities markets. And I like to think of this session as a common sense approach to investing, kind of going back to the roots of some of the, uh, the greatest thinking of, of the men who helped shape the state of market analysis, people like Benjamin Graham and Peter Lynch and Warren Buffett. And these are, uh, these are men who have created uh, strategies and uh, uh, analysis tools that we still use today. And at our company, these are the tools and the precepts that we use to, to pick stocks uh, that we teach to our, our members and our customers about how to invest successfully in the market. So I like to keep things as simple as possible and as straightforward as possible. So we boiled it down to two important components of investing. And I'll tell you right now, it's not buy low and sell high, although that's obviously the goal of any investing strategy. This is really about the, the pragmatic approach that you can take, that anyone can use to invest successfully in the stock market. Now, our company, iClub Central, I'm the president of that uh, company. We are a subsidiary of the nonprofit investor education group, Better Investing. We make software for individual investors and investment clubs, uh, as the name implies, iClub Central. But we also publish two investing newsletters, the Investor Advisory Service and the Small Cap Informer. Uh, using these, this approach to uh, selecting stocks that I'm going to talk about today, uh, we've been able to deliver some good results, uh, especially from our Investor Advisory Service newsletter, which has been published for more than 40 years and has a, market of, uh, a record of outperforming the stock market over the last decade, over the last 20 years, through bull markets and bear markets, we tend to outperform uh, the market, uh, and we have a really strong performance record. But when you have a track record of 40 plus years of investing in the market, there's a collective sense of uh, wisdom and knowledge about how the markets work, uh, and there's a lot that uh, our team has learned over the course of those four plus decades. So one of the things that we believe, uh, that we hold firmly as key ideals include uh, that the best way to invest in the market uh, for most individuals is to buy high quality, solid growth companies, uh, maintaining a long-term horizon. Uh, and that there are a lot of advantages to that long-term horizon that have not shifted with the advent of all of the instant gratification that comes from today's uh, real-time trading and social media-based uh, instantaneous stock market analysis and 24-hour coverage of, of the markets on financial television. Uh, all of that has not changed our approach, looking out past the next recession, looking out past the next bear market to the, the times when we'll see recoveries, the market reaching new highs, the economy uh, dipping and then climbing again. Uh, and so putting that all in the control of the individual investor's portfolio. We also believe that this long-term approach has advantages by reducing the drag that commissions and capital gains taxes uh, take on your portfolio. You don't have to worry about trading costs with that long-term based portfolio. You don't have to worry about uh, capital gains uh, that are forced upon you uh, by decisions that come from a short-term trading approach or from uh, investing in ETFs or mutual funds. You can determine the capital gains, uh, you can harvest gains and losses and offset them uh, when you need distributions. Uh, there's some handouts here uh, and they're also in the back if you guys want to grab them. We also believe that uh, having a buy and hold investing approach requires a lower time commitment than active strategies. Uh, here at The Money Show you'll find a lot of companies that are selling services that will help you uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, or the, that promise to help you uh, beat the market on a regular basis, but they require an active strategy. You've got to be on the computer every day. You've got to be closing out positions uh, once a week so that you, uh, and it requires a whole lot of time. Uh, our, our approach is that there are better things you can be doing with your time than sitting at your computers, uh, although some wives uh, complain that the husband, uh, having the husband around the house during retirement is something that uh, is uh, uh, not as productive and maybe it's a good hobby for him to have, to go sit at the Schwab office or the Fidelity office and, and worry about uh, personal finance and investing decisions. But it doesn't it's not necessary and that's the whole approach. 
But one of the key reasons that we maintain a, this uh, a belief in the long-term nature of stock market investing is that it's a risk reduction strategy. And I hear all the time from people who say, oh, I can't hold through a bear market. Uh, I'd rather sell when the market is low uh, and uh, buy it back when it's high. And they don't recognize that uh, they've just uh, sabotaged their entire strategy uh, by uh, letting fear and uncertainty and doubt rule their investment decision making. We believe that if you just hold on through the bear markets with the conviction that has never been unproven that there is no bear market that hasn't ended. Right? Bear markets always do end. Uh, there's a German proverb that says uh, that the uh, wolf is always bigger in the imagination. Uh, and the same thing is true about bear markets. In our minds, the bear markets have, uh, have a hold on us and cause us to, to second guess every investment decision that we make. But in reality, bear markets are simple market declines uh, and then followed by a market recovery. Uh, and we go through this bear and bull cycle. So if you're going to be driven by a fear of the bear market, uh, you're, you're, you're undermining the entire approach. Our approach is, yeah, we let the, the company's uh, value go down in our portfolio with the knowledge that they're going to come back up. And we use bear markets as periods by which we replenish our portfolio, we put additional capital into the market, we sell uh, lower quality companies and, and uh, uh, load up on the higher quality discounted stocks that are available to us as, as sensible investors who aren't ruled by emotion. So that in effect over the course of the long term, over the course of 10 or 20 years, uh, has a, a, a significant impact on the total return potential of a portfolio. Now our approach in buying individual stocks, when we examine a company, we have a goal for that company of doubling our investment in five years, which is roughly a 15% compound annual return. And, and uh, here at The Money Show, you'll hear uh, advisors touting returns much higher than 15%. But when you consider the overall returns of the, of the market uh, in the 10 to 12% range uh, for the US uh, large cap market, a 15% return is a significant premium over the average of the long-term returns of the market. Uh, and that's what we want. We want to do a little better than the market. If we just want to match the market, we could go index. Uh, but we're selecting individual stocks, so we want to compensate for the additional risk we take on with some additional reward. Our goal in achieving this return uh, is, comes from three places. First is capital appreciation. This is simply, we buy a stock and it goes up. For most of us, it's uh, the opposite of what happens the day after you buy a stock. You buy a stock and immediately, it goes down. It's one of the most predictive uh, uh, indicators there seems to be in the marketplace. But over the long term, we want to see earnings growing. And as earnings grow, the share price will follow. And that is always the case in the long term. There are no exceptions. In the short term, anything can happen that can affect the price of a stock. But over the long term, earnings growth requires uh, that share growth follow along. That's just the nature of business. When you build a business, if it's profitable, if it makes money, it becomes more valuable. Uh, and so that is our objective, primarily capital appreciation. But total return also comes from dividends, which can add a 2 to 4% yield uh, of the uh, total return component, 2 to 4% uh, uh, on an annual basis, uh, especially for large and mega cap stocks that we follow. Not all companies pay them. We don't chase dividends. We don't chase yields. But we'll take the money when the companies offer it. And then finally, uh, what we call price earnings ratio expansion provides the third component of total return. This is our practice of buying stocks when they are undervalued, when they are where priced below their average valuation. And we measure that by looking at the PE ratio. In today's market, those are hard to come by. But true to our Midwest ethos, we are not cheapskates. That's a, that's a bad word. We're, we're frugal. So we like buying companies when they are undervalued. We love it when we can find a high quality company and we can pay less than people have in the past uh, for that particular asset. So we, we have a, a strong value bias to our approach. And put those three together in varying, various combinations uh, and we can achieve our investing goal, uh, again, over the long term in a portfolio of 15 to 20 uh, individual equities. 
It's important to recognize that we don't advocate a, a trading strategy. We really believe that if you hold a portfolio of carefully selected stocks with a long-term horizon, uh, you don't try to time the market, you don't try to lock in gains, which prevents future gains from that stock. Uh, maybe you have trailing losses on the downside to protect, your, uh, protect your, the returns that you've earned. But really, we recognize that stocks don't follow a schedule. They don't know that you own them. They don't feel an obligation to you to perform. Uh, and that there are always going to be ups and downs in the, the, the average prices of equities in the market. Having said that, we're not afraid of selling. Buy and, loss, uh, buy and hold uh, stock methodology often gets a bad rap for uh, people who interpret it as buy and never sell. Uh, and, and that is not the case at all. Uh, when, uh, when there are fundamental problems, we will take action and, and recommend selling a company. We recommend that you, you get out. We do the analysis. We figure out if the long-term trends are, are still in place, if the factors that caused us to, to like that company originally are still in play, then we may hold on to it even during the downturn. Uh, one of the founders of our newsletter was a World War II veteran, and he used to uh, commonly qu quote to us that, uh, to remind us that a torpedo can come out of the dark at any time. So we want to be watchful. Uh, we want to take evasive action when necessary, uh, but uh, uh, it, sometimes it happens. Uh, our approach, as I said, is uh, not to buy and forget, but to buy and manage the companies, uh, manage the holdings, and acknowledge our, our mistakes. And just like all of you, we struggle with that at times. Uh, but we certainly don't want to take on strategies like waiting to get even before making the sell decision. We try to rule out the, the influence of uh, some of the psychological barriers that inhibit behavior when we're dealing with, with money decisions. Uh, and some of those are, are, uh, uh, help us to uh, uh, avert losses in our minds and to negate the negative impacts that come when we sell companies that have underperformed. Uh, so we delay making that sale decision uh, and in effect because we don't want to feel bad and because of the stock that's gone down in price, it could always come back. If I can get, wait until I get 80% of my money back, then I'll sell it, you say. And then it's, if I get half my money back, I'll, when it gets to that point, I'm going to sell that stock. When I get, you know, if, if I can get 30% of my original purchase, I'll, I'll, I'll sell, definitely sell it then. And you negotiate down with stocks that are not performing well uh, because you've got that glimmer of hope that maybe, maybe the stock will turn around and perform well. So we want to eliminate those types of uh, in, in psychological uh, uh, influences on our behavior. Focus on the fundamentals. Take an emotion-free uh, approach to the stocks. Recognize that there are always good companies that are waiting for us to find them and invest in for our individual portfolios. So we're not aiming to be right 100% of the time. Some of you probably are right 100% of the time, uh, but we'll acknowledge that in our investing decisions, we're comfortable being right 80% of the time. And our experience is that for every 10 stocks that we buy using our approach, two of them are going to perform really, really well. And we're going to talk about those companies. It's human nature. We're going to brag about them. We're going to remind our friends and family about the stock that we bought, the triple in value that's done really well. Uh, and uh, uh, it validates our, our, our status as a, a stock analyst who can actually pick stocks. Two of the stocks that we pick out of every 10 are going to be disappointments. And often they're not uh, situations that we could foresee. They simply happen. They're going to cause a lot of anguish. These are the ones that will keep you up at night. You're going to be wondering what I should do. You're going to come to the money show and ask the, the experts, what should I do with this company or that company? It's down so much. Uh, you wonder, should you do like Peter Lynch says and back up the truck and load up on that company now that you've lost 40% of your original purchase and it really must be a bargain now or should we get rid of it? So you spend a lot of time trying to debate with yourself what to do with these, uh, this disappointment. But six out of every 10 stocks are going to perform uh, reasonably well. They're going over time to deliver our target return. 
Uh, and uh, we're not going to think very much about them. They're, they're, they're always going to show up in green in our uh, loss uh, gain uh, column. Uh, and uh, they're uh, going to be just kind of boring stocks that have gone up in price. And we kind of take them for granted. But if you add these two together, six plus two, eight of the 10 stocks that you buy are going to perform as well or better than your, your expected uh, uh, course for those companies. And that's a pretty great track record. And that's enough to perform better than most professional mutual fund uh, analysts. Uh, they don't have that type of success picking stocks. A lot of uh, uh, newsletters, a lot of professional uh, market analysts and advisors don't have that type of success as well for a lot of reasons that uh, have to do with the size of mutual funds or the size of portfolios that you're managing uh, and that uh, they can't uh, buy uh, stocks that are smaller, that have uh, better rates of return, higher growth rates. Uh, so there are a lot of things that, that are in our favor as individual investors. So with that in mind, here are the two keys to successful stock investing from our approach. And you boil it down to one, find good companies. We don't want to invest in uh, companies that have great stories. We want to have uh, companies in our portfolio that have successful management teams that have delivered success in the past for the business. We want to see profits. We want to see uh, services and products that are desired by the market. Uh, we want to see uh, that these are well-run businesses first and foremost. And once we found those companies, we want to buy them at reasonable prices. All right, we'll buy them at cheap prices if we can get them. And if you can find excellent businesses selling at reasonable prices over time in a portfolio, then you have the, the recipe for successful long-term investing. And I make a very distinct, uh, uh, distinct uh, uh, definition of investing, especially as opposed to trading. Investing is holding on to securities with a long-term perspective. And you can define long-term as you want. Our long-term horizon is five years down the road. Trading is something completely different. Uh, and so uh, that is definitely a, a much shorter holding period of seconds to minutes to days uh, to, uh, to weeks to months. But our approach is we're, we're looking at the stocks in our portfolio as owners of the business. Uh, and for us, it brings it back to the one thing that no one can really argue with about how investing works. And that is that as companies grow, as they increase their sales and their earnings over time, their value goes up. The share prices go up. Right? And this key here is that over time, the last two words, in the short term, anything can happen that can impact share prices. Last year, Brexit uh, immediately impacted US stock prices for a day or two. Right? Didn't have a lot of impact for a lot of American businesses. However, it was a market rattling event for a day. And then the market recovered. Right? So just one example of all of the external influences that somehow make their way into the market and drive values up or down in the short term. But over the long term, if you're delivering profits, your business becomes more valuable. Uh, this is a graph from one of our software programs where, that we use to analyze the stability and strength of growth of companies. So on the top in that, that green line is the sales over 10 years, followed by the pre-tax profit, followed by the earnings per share. Uh, and uh, down below, you'll see the, the black eye bars representing the annual high and low prices. So you can see this company has been growing at a very consistent rate over time. Sales have been growing, going up, some years a little bit more than others. Earnings are following right along. Uh, we can identify 2008 when we had a recession. So we can look at this business and see maybe a little bit of a slowdown in sales growth from 2008 to 2009. But they were not at all, uh, didn't take a big hit during the recession. So that gives us a clue about the, the business that this company is involved in. And uh, that uh, as the sales and earnings are, are on that upward consistent trajectory, we see the share prices going up and down over time as well. But primarily trending upward. 
We do acknowledge that during the financial crisis, during the, the recession, during the, the, the uh, uh, bear market, uh, or the correction of 2008, uh, we do see the share prices dropped considerably. The low prices reached new lows, the lowest point in 10 years. You see the very wide bars in 2008 and 2009 between the high and low prices. But the company was still delivering earnings. It was still delivering profits. So if you had the, the, the fortitude to buy a company like that in the bear market when when you hear on TV all of these advisors recommending uh, after prices had declined 20%, now it's time to move to cash, move to the sidelines, consider alternative investments, get out of the stock market. If you had had the fortitude to be in the market and be buying at that point, you would have seen a significant rate of return over time. That's what we like to look for. Uh, those are the situations that we like. We don't welcome bear markets, but we re recognize that wealth is built during bear markets if you're an individual stock market investor. So what is a good company? That's the first of my two keys to successful stock picking. And there are two things that we ask primarily when we look at companies to identify their quality. One is, are they growing profits? If our approach is based on finding companies that grow profits, we want to understand how that growth comes about. Is it consistent growth? Is it adequate growth for the size of the company? What are the tailwinds that are pushing this company, uh, helping this company to perform better on an annual basis? What are the headwinds that are pressuring growth that could limit growth in the future? So we'll do the deep dive and try to understand it, not just looking at the, the numbers on a graph, uh, but understand from the company's, uh, the management's uh, discussion in their uh, SEC filings uh, and uh, do in, in as part of our research. Uh, the second point about uh, identifying good companies is that uh, we want to see stable or growing profit margins. And for us, for me, the profit margin is really key because it allows you to compare like companies, like to like to find which company is better, gives you an overall assessment of how well management is running the business. If their business objective is making money, the margin tells you how efficient they are at, do at doing that. So let me break those down. When we talk about growth, we demand profitability. So we acknowledge there's a portion of your portfolio, maybe five to 10% of your stock market exposure, that could be uh, deployed in uh, the concept stocks, we'll call them, uh, emerging companies, companies that have a great uh, idea, uh, maybe not making a lot of money just yet, smaller businesses, startups. Uh, and so there's a portion of your portfolio that you could be putting there. Some people say it's the mad money portion of their portfolio, uh, but just a little bit. When those companies do hit, they perform well and can deliver good returns, but you certainly don't want to include them in your core holdings. Your core holdings, your core stock portfolio should have companies that have uh, earnings and revenue growing uh, at, a, at a good rate, uh, both on an annual basis, looking back over as much of a decade of history, uh, over the last quarter, the trailing 12 months, we want to see com companies that are persistently pushing their earnings up. And uh, we, we have different standards for smaller companies compared to larger companies. Smaller companies, we demand more growth from those smaller businesses to compensate from the risks that come from investing in the smaller side of the market. Uh, so our software helps us with that. Uh, we can look at um, uh, the growth of the, uh, the historical growth of the company uh, with a little bit, uh, a little bit easier than, than crunching all the numbers all the time. So we like consistent growth and believe that the picture tells a word. And I'm going to show you some, some images in a minute. So on that graph, you know, uh, if you can tell the difference between a jagged line and a straight line, then you can evaluate the consistency of a company's growth because consistency is straight. So the graph really helps us to, to understand and visualize the company's history. Uh, and as I mentioned, we want to see smaller companies growing faster than larger companies. So if you look at a company like this, uh, which is an automaker, uh, and if our requirement is that sales should be growing and earnings growing at a, at a, a commensurate clip uh, to sales growth, do we see consistency here? Well, for the sales growth, the top green line, we do see consistency. It's consistently flat. 
We don't see sales increasing. Uh, we see sales actually have declined over the last decade from where they were 10 years ago for this company. Uh, on the earnings side, we see earnings going up, going down. Highly cyclical, we see uh, a lot of volatility or variation uh, in the earnings growth over time. So investors who are looking at this company are not necessarily considering it as a growth opportunity. And there might be other strategies that think that this is a great company. For us, it doesn't meet our criteria. We have no sense that there is a, uh, any kind of momentum driving sales and earnings growth uh, in the future. They may have a great year. They may have a terrible year. We have no sense of that as we're looking at it. C contrast that with this company. Uh, which has, as you can see here, consistent sales growth, consistent, uh, more consistent earnings growth. And you can see the pre-tax profit in the middle, that pink line, uh, kind of growing as well, um, evenly with the earnings more or less. Here you can see, as we measure these two together, you can see the pre-tax profit and earnings are a little bit steeper than the sales growth line, which means the company's becoming more efficient. The margin's going up as they increase sales. This happens to be Priceline, which is one of the stocks that we cover in our investor advisory service. Uh, we like it because it's, uh, uh, it's a global company. Everyone thinks about Priceline as the, the name your, your price hotel business, uh, but they, their business is much wider than that, especially in, in Europe and outside the US where they have an enormous hotel booking uh, website that's used by the highly fragmented uh, hotel market outside the U.S. Here in the U.S., hotels belong to chains. When you go outside the U.S., that's not as common. There are a lot of independently operated hotels, guest houses, boutique hotels, uh, and so uh, they don't have the, the benefits of being in a chain. Priceline provides a booking tool for those, uh, those hotels to, to use to give them access to travelers. Uh, so there's a big part of the business. There's a euro-denominated business and dollar-denominated. So it has a lot of nice pieces. But the, the story here is that uh, this is a growing business with consistent growth. Here's another company. Uh, this is Tractor Supply, uh, which uh, is a sort of uh, uh, competitor to Home Depot and Lowe's in many ways. However, they're smaller format stores, uh, which is more suitable for a lot of the country that can't support the big box uh, home retailers, but they provide uh, pet supplies and, and livestock supplies, a tractor supply, uh, the gentleman farmer's store, if you will, uh, replacing the old feed mill of uh, years gone by. Uh, but uh, we think this is a company that has a lot of opportunity as well. And you can see, again, you can see the similar trend, growth, very stable of sales, uh, earnings growing a little bit faster than sales, which means they're increasing their efficiency. So these are the types of companies that we're looking for that we consider in our portfolio. Uh, these are not enormous businesses, $6 billion for tractor supply, $9 billion for uh, Priceline, which means there's a lot of potential for growth in the future. Now, having looked at the historical growth, we want to consider what the future growth is going to be. Uh, the, the tool provides uh, with us with some trend analysis functionality where we can simply say, look at growth. It's been consistently growing at 10% a year. So future growth is probably likely to be um, uh, no more than that, certainly. Uh, and it may be a little bit slower as the company grows, but it's certainly uh, going to be um, uh, uh, not sig too significantly different unless there are some drivers in force that we can identify. So we will look at analyst estimates. We'll, we'll talk to the companies, get their guidance. Uh, for what earnings and sales growth is likely to be in the, in the short term. Uh, and this gives us, uh, when we're done with this analysis, uh, an idea of where earnings will be in five years, five years down the road. And that's important to remember that number. So we've got earnings, what we think they're going to be. And it, there might be a range of earnings. But uh, we'll have some confidence that the company can achieve that uh, if they continue to grow as they've been growing. So we'll come back to that, that, but just remember, we're looking at a five-year earnings uh, growth uh, profile uh, for the company. So now we're going to talk about quality. There are lots of ways to analyze quality. If you look at Value Line or S&P or Morningstar, they have quality ratings. Uh, there, if you uh, ever studied finance and investing at university, you know there are all sorts of ratios that you're meant to, to use, hundreds of them that you can analyze a company's business uh, up one side, down, and the other. Uh, but for us, 
There's really one factor that helps you identify the quality of a business, the quality of management, the skill of the team running the business that tells you more than just about everything else. And that's the pre-tax profit margin. The percentage that the company earns on every dollar of sales before taxes. Now we take taxes out of the equation because traditionally companies had little ability to manage their corporate tax rate. In the last two decades, companies have figured out, and tax lawyers have gotten involved, figured out all sorts of ways that they can reduce their corporate tax burden, all sorts of write-offs and deductions. But we're still going to focus on the operations of the business before the tax impact. And that will give us an idea, again, of the, 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 uh, the company business. So we'll focus on that pre-tax profit margin, percentage of each uh, dollar profit the company makes on sales. Margins vary greatly from industry to industry, uh, and we'll acknowledge that up front. So we're not looking at a percentage. We, we demand profit margins of 13% or better. Uh, for, for smaller companies, they might be different from different industries. Uh, for um, uh, uh, grocery store stocks have a profit margin of 2 to 3%. Right? That means for every dollar they sell, uh, it, 96, 97 percent, uh, cents uh, goes to expenses. It uh, goes to, to food costs, material costs, uh, facility costs, labor costs, transportation costs. You know, so they're left with, when you spend a dollar at Kroger, uh, they keep about 95 cents of it. Uh, they, they keep about five cents of it, and 95 cents gets, uh, 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 goes out the door as expenses. And they're going to pay taxes on that five cents as well, corporate income taxes. So if you look at a company like Microsoft, you know, they don't have warehouses filled with Windows 10 packages, right? They used to have, when you bought Windows 3 or Windows 95, it came in a giant box with 30 CD, you know, floppy disks to install that operating system. Now it's all online. So Microsoft doesn't have inventory. They don't have warehouses. They have servers and server farms. They have intellectual capital. Their margins will be 30 40% for a business like that. Uh, so we're going to compare like to like when we're doing our, our analysis. We like to see margins very stable. Uh, because when you think about profit margins, and you think about labor costs, and energy costs, and you think about uh, occupancy costs, and you think about the cost of raw materials for your business, you think about all of the things that, that, that companies have to expense before they get even to sell a product or a service, there are a lot of moving parts. Uh, when uh, we have a fuel crisis and gas prices go up to $4 a gallon, that impacts a wide swath of business because everyone's dependent on transportation right, or energy. Uh, and so you see a lot of companies scrambling. Uh, airlines, uh, I think a lot of airlines, uh, what happens when uh, fuel costs go up? they want to implement surcharges because somehow they never imagined that air fuel would become more expensive. And for me, that's a sign of a management that's not really uh, in tune with the realities of their particular business. Uh, cruise lines use a lot of fuel. When fuel costs go up, they have a fuel surcharge that they want to implement. So they never imagined. Uh, other companies uh, who use fuel may have hedging strategies, Southwest Air, uh, was you know, very active in hedging the cost of fuel. So they buy options uh, that may expire or allow them to maintain their fuel price within a range. And that's a very significant way of, of controlling expenses. So we like to look for companies with strategies like that uh, so that, that we can uh, make sure that they're protecting those margins uh, on the downside. But all those moving parts mean that management have to ha be looking at all sorts of aspects of the business. And so if you're able to do that consistently, year to year to year to year to year, uh, then that is really giving us a, a good clue that this company uh, is doing a good job of uh, delivering on the bottom line, because they're controlling all the aspects of the business. Certainly, if the margins are declining, 
That could be due to competition, could be due to unchecked uh, raw material prices. Uh, Rubbermaid in the 1990s was a classic growth company, top management team, uh, regularly recognized by Forbes and Fortune as you know, admired company, best, most admired company in America. Uh, when raw material costs started to go up, Rubbermaid couldn't control them didn't have a plan in place to cover the, the contingency that their raw material costs would go up. All they could do was try to raise prices. Uh, so they went to their number one customer down in Bentonville, Arkansas, Walmart, and said, we, raw material costs have gone up, so we're going to be increasing the cost of all of our, the wholesale prices of all of our products, our trash cans and laundry baskets and, and tubs, uh, everything by a couple of cents each on a wholesale basis. And so you can just raise your prices to your customers a little bit. And Walmart in the 1990s, very much of the low price everyday strategy said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to raise our prices. We have this low price everyday strategy. So we can't raise prices on a, this enormous product line. And besides, have you heard of Sterilite? Because they've been knocking on our door saying, we have laundry baskets for less than Rubbermaid has. So we'll just go over here if, if you're going to raise your prices. And we'll have actually a cheaper product. And we think our customers aren't going to care. And there are some people who care about the color of the laundry basket that must ma match the color of the washing machine or the decor of the bedroom. Uh, and this is one of Rubbermaid's problems. They had 17 different colors of laundry baskets and matching trash cans and tubs. And uh, so they eventually, uh, in, and after this, all, this crisis happened, they reduced the number of SKUs in their system by eliminating 13 of the 17 colors, focusing on black, white, putty, and that light blue color, which is maintained today even though the company uh, was acquired. Uh, Rubbermaid merged with Newell, which was really a way of, uh, uh, of Newell rescuing Rubbermaid and taking it over and using the brand name um, that had a lot of value. Uh, but a company, a well-run company, got tripped up by raw material cost increases. They couldn't uh, accommodate it in their business model. Uh, there was a, a limit to how much people are willing to pay for a laundry basket. Their advertising uh, was focused on, uh, uh, actually had ads of women who had their mother's laundry basket, right? Well, if you sell a laundry basket that lasts for 30 years, you're kind of uh, destroying your market, right? Not that they should fall apart, but you know, this is a $10 item that lasts for 30 years. It's not a particularly good business model. So we do a lot of analysis looking at that aspect of the business. It's like I mentioned, we look at this, we have a 10-year history, we have a five-year future. You know, we have this 15-year slice of, uh, of time that we work within in constructing our framework. And that's because we're going to look back at the recession. Because what happens during a recession tells you a lot about a company's management. Are they able to maintain profitability, or are they uh, seeing their earnings fall precipitously during that time? It's not to say that every business can't perform uh, exceptionally in, an, in, an, in, a, in a recession, but many companies do uh, or perform better than their peers, which again gives us an important clue. And again, the graph tells the story. Uh, here's a great business. Uh, you can see the margins uh, expanding over time. That, five, that red line is the five-year average. So we can see that those margins just increasing. This is Visa. Uh, Visa's had some tough times uh, in the last few years. They've had some lawsuits, but their margins are above 60%. So for every dollar of revenue uh, they make, they keep 60% of it, more than 60% of it. And then they pay taxes on the balance. Uh, so we like to see that kind of business. Uh, here's another an example. This is Gentex. Uh, they make uh, automobile mirrors and uh, now backup cameras and uh, uh, other automobile accessories, OEM parts, uh, that are becoming standard in, uh, in many v new vehicles. Uh, so yeah, we see in this case, we see 2008, we see margins fall off. Why in 2008 would margins fall off? Well, this was the financial crisis. So this is when companies were, were falling apart. 
uh, auto, uh, 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 nobody was buying new cars. Uh, the, the federal, the Fed stepped in and started buying back old vehicles and junking them so that you'd kill the used car market and force people to, uh, and send people to buy new cars. Uh, but ever since then, they've been recovering well and, and continuing to grow their business. We like that. Uh, tractor supply company. Again, just a steady upward trend in a, in a fairly low margin business, but, but their margins uh, exceed 10% uh, now and uh, have continued to expand, so we like that. So we do our research, we find good companies. What do we do? Well, we don't, uh, we don't jump right in and say, okay, let's buy it, because uh, our second step is buying it at a cheap valuation. Uh, so what makes a stock cheap? Well, the stock's growing well, it's growing consistently, and we can pay less than investors have in the past on a relative basis for a share of that stock, then we might be getting a bargain. This is hard in the current market, but the P-E ratio is what we believe can help you make that decision. The P-E ratio, just really quickly, the current price, we look at the annual earnings for the trailing 12 months to calculate it. We're not using a, a, a projected P-E ratio. Uh, we're looking at the trailing. For us, it tells us how much uh, investors are willing to pay for the stock for every dollar of earnings. By itself, the PE doesn't tell us a whole lot because I told you that the stock is a PE of 30. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, we need to compare it to something, to other stocks, to the overall market, to the company's history, uh, to the growth rate, especially to the growth rate of the company. So we'll look at the current PE. We'll compare it to the range of PEs over the last five years. Uh, and uh, we want to see that PE ideally close to the, the average P-E ratio uh, that the stock has been selling at. If it's above the average, it's on the higher side. If it's below the average, it's on the lower side. We'll also look at things like the peg ratio. Uh, but that P-E analysis that we do allows us to, to get a sense of what the maximum P-E is going to be in the future. You know, we can see if the P-E's are contracting or expanding over time. But once we have a sense of the average and the current P-E ratio, we can figure out what's the likely high and low P-E ratio in the future. Uh, and so, once we have that high P-E ratio, and we have that five-year earnings figure that we talked about before, well, that we can back into the price, the price that we expect this company to reach in five years, assuming that it reaches our earnings goal, and assuming that the stock trades, as it has in the past, at a P-E ratio uh, within a range. And of course, we're, we're conservative, so we, you know, we, we set a target and then we lower it so that make sure that we've got some wiggle room or some margin of safety uh, in our analysis. We'll also do the same thing on the downside. If we know the likely lowest P-E ratio the stock will trade at, assuming the company continues to perform, and we know what the earnings have been in the last uh, 12 months or the, uh, uh, the next, uh, the next two, two quarters and the last two quarters, uh, we can figure out a reasonable uh, assessment of the downside and these are predicated on the company doing business as usual. If, if something trips them up, then all bets are off and we need to do a reanalysis. But you know, those, again, are going to be 20% of the time we're going to be faced with those situations. 80% of the time, companies are going to chug along and they're going to meet these goals that we set up. So the P-E ratio gets a bad rap in many, in many, um, uh, many quarters, but we do like to uh, consider how well the company uh, growth rate matches the P-E ratio, because we understand that uh, the maximum that investors will pay for a stock, it varies with uh, the, market the market sentiment. Uh, now that's a, a, investors are willing to pay a little bit more for stocks than they have in the past because they're not getting any return from bonds, so investors have uh, jumped over into the equity market. But we also know that if a company's growth isn't there, investors are not going to be willing to pay for it. Uh, so we're going to uh, do that deep analysis. Um, I do a whole you know, hour-long presentation on PE ratio analysis for our subscribers and members uh, where we delve into this. It's a skill that's acquired over time, but there are some rules of thumb that, that we utilize. So here's an example from Dollar General stock that we recently pick. You can see the trend of high and low P-E ratios annual, on an annual basis. And you can see on the right, far right, the green dot there is the current P-E. Uh, so you can say it's in between that range. So we would consider that uh, fairly reasonable uh, given the, the current market and the elevated P-E ratios that investors are willing to pay. 
so that's, again, what we like to see. Uh, we, we might expect that PE ratio to increase a little bit, give us our PE ratio expansion. On the downside, we know what the likely downside risk is uh, if the stock reaches, it sells at that low PE ratio uh, that we've established. So that gives us our, our sense of uh, the proper valuation and the hard work is over. Um, we've got our future high and low prices, as I explained, using that high PE ratio and our earnings per share projection. Uh, and uh, there's just one more step that we go through just to make sure that we're maximizing the reward and minimizing the risk. We want to make sure we've got plenty of upside to compensate us for the risk of investing in the market. So we've got our upside to our downside comparison that we do. Uh, and we want to make sure that we've got at least three times the upside to the projected downside for all the companies in our portfolio, giving us our 15% compound annual return for each company. Uh, not that every company is going to reach it, but that's our target and we'll, we'll go from there. So finally, just to wrap it up, a lot of our customers uh, like to uh, take this approach and they'll add on a layer of technicals, they'll add on uh, some analysis to give them uh, trailing stop loss, order prices on the downside or give them, uh, use a, the momentum and moving averages to give them an entry point price. Uh, knowing that they found a good company, uh, they just want to wait for the market sentiment to switch around. Again, we're, we're, uh, 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 we're ambivalent about this approach, but it is something that uh, many of our subscribers do look at. Now, we don't ever sell to take a profit. We don't lock in profits. We believe when you sell to lock in a profit, you are locking out all future potential profits. And if you went out to your garden and you cut off the heads of all the blooms of all the flowers, uh, what would you be left with? You'd be left with a lot of weeds. Uh, but that's an investing approach that's commonly taught by Wall Street. Sell all your winners, and then what are you left with in your portfolio? All your losers. We think that's kind of contra contrary to uh, the proper investment approach. So we occasionally sell an overvaluation. Most often we're selling due, due to deteriorating fundamentals. So this is the, in a nutshell, is the approach that our investor advisory service has been using over the last uh, 40 plus years. We've been named to the Holbert honor roll for the last seven years, uh, outperforming all the bull and bear market cycles. We have a team of analysts who are uh, chartered financial analysts who use this same approach. Uh, the green is the, the investor advisory service track record over the last 10 years and the last 20 years compared to the Wilshire and the S&P 500. Uh, so uh, we believe that this approach really delivers the returns that investors are really looking for. Uh, but it seems too simple for, for many people uh, when you can pay a lot more money to get a lot more complex analysis that doesn't deliver you any better returns. Uh, but our approach based in common sense we think is uh, one of the best for the average investor who wants to invest in the stock market. So we're going to have to wrap it up, but we are in the exhibit hall and there are uh, uh, on the last page of the handout uh, how you can reach me. There's my email address down at the bottom. So feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions and we'll be in the exhibit hall the rest of the day. So I'm going to thank you for coming out this morning and I hope the rest of your day is uh, productive and profitable and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>